This is the Extra Point Podcast. During this podcast, we will dive deeper into our Sunday teaching and share practical next steps for your faith journey. Now, let's kick off the Extra Point. Hey, welcome to the Extra Point. My name is Cheryl Ross. I'm the Next Steps and Discipleship Pastor here at Southwater Church, and I'm with Scott Beha, our lead pastor. And um, before we go any further, just make sure that if you haven't liked or subscribed to this podcast that you do so. That way you don't miss out on anything new. Uh, But we're in week three of our series, Hills to Die On, where we're going through some non-negotiables for the teachings and theology of the Church of God movement that we are a part of. And um, this week we were talking about the Great Commission. And Pastor Scott, you shared um, in a kind of a different way within this this teaching that you did. Um, but you also shared a lot of really interesting statistics about how um, Christians share or don't share their faith and how people like non-believers feel about that. And um, one of the quotes that you shared from Alvin Reed said that lost people are more amazed at our silence than offended by our message. I think that's such a powerful thought for us because I think that most people, a lot of times we don't want to share because we're afraid of offending someone that believes different. But that right there should really kind of give us a little bit of encouragement in what we're doing, right? Yeah, I think, honestly, not doing something in today's day and age because you're afraid of offending someone is a fool's errand because it doesn't matter what you do, you're going to offend somebody. That's just the, the facts of life, right? Because I think non, some non-believers are offended by the message. Other non-believers are offended at the fact that you think that they are going to spend eternity in a place called hell, and yet you haven't said anything right. to them in regard. So, like, they find it to be equally as offensive on either side. So, like, it's, you know, what does it matter? Oh, somebody's going to be offended no matter what. So why not be faithful to what we've been mm-hmm. asked to do and, and try to make disciples? If you have to leave somebody offended, you know, at least – leave them offended with trying to reach them with the gospel out of love Mm -hmm. rather than letting them be offended at your silence and and, because that shows a lack of care um, for them. But, yeah, not doing something because you're going to offend somebody. I mean, goodness gracious, Mm -hmm. everything is offensive nowadays. (laughs) We just live in the most offendable culture. Like, you could do practically nothing Mm -hmm. and somebody's offended. Like, I. I'm I'm hardly shocked anymore when someone says, "Oh yeah, someone got upset about this," and I go, <laughs> "Yeah, of course, of they, course did. they did." Because s- as soon as we got social media, everyone thought that their opinions were now so valuable mm-hmm. that any time something go doesn't go their way, now they're the offended mm-hmm. party over everything. So you can't live your life trying not to offend people. Just on a practical level, the other part of that quote though is like. The studies actually show people are far more mm-hmm. um, offended at your silence. They're yeah. far more, like, just amazed, like, you really think that mm-hmm. is true about me, that I'm going to spend eternity in hell, mm-hmm. and yet you have not ever, not right. even brought it up? Like, that's what you, like, and so it, that seems very inconsistent to people. Mm-hmm. And again, that's not, if, if you're hearing me say, like, oh, okay, well, that's probably the starting point, right? Let's tell them mm-hmm. that they're going to hell. No. Um, you need a, a better evangelism strategy than that. Yeah. Um, that doesn't start with judgment because some of the, the some of the statistics I had to leave out of the sermon, or else we would have been there for like four hours. There's there was two characteristics of people mm-hmm. um, that had that that non-believers wanted to talk to. The number one thing they said they had to be someone that could have a conversation and withhold judgment during it. Mm-hmm. And and truthfully, that's not been um, uh, a good uh, characteristic of a lot of Christians, right. being able to withhold um, judgment in a conversation or not doing something, um, mm-hmm. and like being able to answer questions and things like that. Mm-hmm. And I know a lot of people, and because this is also the the stats that I left out, mm-hmm. um, I shared that sixty percent of people believe that. Um, Christians are, or actually 66% of people believe that the most loving thing that you can do is share um, Jesus with someone. Like 60% of people agreed, yes, that's what Christians are supposed to do. But uh, the large majority of them 
did say that they believe that the role of their pastor is to equip them right. to do so. And um, so so they there's people that, that don't feel comfortable for many different reasons with it, and some of it may be that they don't feel properly equipped. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I would say from the pastoral part of it, I would say, yes, we, we have a responsibility and we need to do a better job of equipping, mm-hmm. but we can't equip people that don't show up. Right. Uh, that's that's the other side of it. I'm not talking about church attendance. I'm mm-hmm. saying we have all of these different ways that we are training people of how to live out their faith through groups, through serving, through giving, through, yes, through showing up at church, but outreach events and all these things. These are the training mm-hmm. ground that the church offers, and, and a lot of people don't take advantage of it. Mm-hmm. So although they want to be equipped, they, they, right. they it's like, well, I can only be equipped from 9 to, mm-hmm. to 10 once or twice a month, or, or else I can't do this. It's like, well, that I mean, you just you're not going to mm-hmm. feel properly equipped at that point. Um, so yeah, we have a we have a role to help people understand how to share their faith yeah. with people, and we are. I would be more than interested. Our whole staff is more than interested in doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, but you also have to show up. It's like a two way street. Like yeah. we will do our part. If you will do your part. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting because I sat in with the youth some yesterday, too, and they were learning the story about Philip and Nathaniel when um, Philip met Jesus and he goes to his friend and shares about about Jesus. Hey, we've I've met the man who's the Messiah that we've heard about, like, you know, and and Nathaniel's kind of skeptic about it at first, but he goes and he learns about Jesus and and realizes who Jesus is in that moment. And they, you know, it's kind of a two-way street of them, like, talking about how they need friends that will also help encourage them to know Jesus better. But they also need to be those kind of friends to do yeah. that. And it was really cool to hear in the discussion, like, the way that the teens talked about it and shared about it. And it was like, you know, there was everything from, like, hey, all my friends are believers. We talk about Jesus all the time to, you know, I have friends who really don't and we never talk about it to, like, Hey, we're kind of in the middle. Like we don't really like we we don't steer this way or that way, like within our discussions. And it was just cool to talk through those things with the teens about how they could like take some little baby steps to get yeah. there and share their faith. And I thought like, you know, in that moment, I was like, this is so cool because this is what adults are learning. And like, if parents and these teens start having these discussions, the teens might actually be able to share some information with their parents about like, hey, well, we talked about this, that these are four ways that we could share um, our faith with our friends. And um, I know that like, when you're, you're here in this big space, and where we're teaching, there's not a whole lot of being able to really um, teach people how to do that in that moment. Like we we share the word and those kinds and some application, but like to get down to it, you, you know, being part of a small group or some kind of a class or doing different things. Yep. If you want to go deeper in that, like those are the things, but like we literally have so much information at our fingertips. Yeah. Um, I remember you were with me with that first trip that we were taking to Nicaragua mm-hmm. years ago. Um, and what we did as part of our group to like prepare for that was we put together these three minute testimonies. Mm -hmm. And if you just Google three minute testimony, you'll find a worksheet that you can download that takes you through. Like it's basically three questions, like what my life was like before Christ, how I came to know Christ. And then what, what my life is like now that I do know Christ. And it's just sometimes just sitting down and working through that and writing out like your story, what your life was like, how you came to know him, how it is now, like that gives you just a little bit of comfort of knowing like, hey, if somebody were to ask, this is how I would share. Yeah, like, and I think on that, like uh, there's a lot of Christians, I think, that are not sh- comfortable sharing mm-hmm. that first part. Yeah. Um, whereas this is where I end up in a lot of uh, good conversations with people mm-hmm. is because I always lead with that first part. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, like, I've had multiple people be like, oh, okay, so you were, like, you were, like, wild. Wild. Like, (laughs) you were wild. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, so when I'm sitting here talking to you about your life, I'm not coming from, like, I'm not coming from, like, a theoretical, Mm -hmm. like, I've been in seminary the last 10 years studying behaviors. Uh I'm saying, like, no, listen, I was, like, drunk seven days a week, Mm -hmm. doing drugs seven days a week, watching pornography seven days a week, like, Mm -hmm. 
an absolute every possible vice you could have, smoking, div- mm-hmm. like just put everything that you could possibly do mm-hmm. into one person, and then make that person very selfish, mm-hmm. very mean, full of anger, full of like just like insecurity, uh, just the worst combination of stuff that you could find in an individual. Yes, that's who I was, and that's why like people go like, oh wow, okay, so this is like. Like this is this is pretty remarkable. Then that this wasn't someone that just like got you know grew up in church. Grew up in church. Never really had a wild streak. Uh-huh. And, and I'm not like your that, sister. Yeah, <laughs> right. But <laughs> even that story <laughs> is yeah. even those sorts of stories. Yeah. People don't recognize them as yeah. such. But there's such power in those stories. But whenever yeah. I share where I've been, yeah. people go like, "Oh, okay. So this is this is yeah. like legit." But I I know a lot of especially our older Christian generation, mm-hmm. a lot of them don't forgot where they came from. Yeah, a lot of, that's oh, yeah. why they're so judgmental on these yeah. people that have issues and problems, and yeah. that's why they like all that because they don't forgot mm-hmm. where they came from. That, that's a lot like you know you see people that are like well off mm-hmm. in life um, that are always throw shade at poor people, and it's mm-hmm. like yeah, but you like where you don't you you're now so wealthy you don't even remember what it was like mm-hmm. whenever you were. We're struggling, and it's the same thing for Christians. Like some mm-hmm. of them, they've been following Jesus so long, they forgot that before they met Jesus, they were a horrible, awful, nasty person as well. Mm-hmm. And like I think when you when you will not hide that part of yourself, yeah, it makes the story so much more beautiful. So even if you do have that story where you you were raised in church, you got saved at an early age, even that, like you have to think, okay, what was my life like before? Christ, you were probably still a little brat at some point. Like, there was still something yeah. about you that, like, had to change. Or even the transformation process after that. Like, if you got saved at eight years old, yeah. pff, you were still a right. terror when you were 12. I mean, Let's not, yeah. let's, like, you were still, you still gave mom and dad an attitude when you were 16 mm-hmm. and talked back. Yeah. Like, you didn't have it all together even then. So, like, try to remember yeah. that time and don't neglect that because, like, mm-hmm. I mean, too often we want to look all buttoned up. We want to tell people about right. how we live now. Oh, well, you know, yeah. the Lord, you know, I do this. I, I, no, they want to know that this is real. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. like. And I think where our stories, like, end up connecting with God's story is what's so powerful is that, like, even the, the stories of the people who have, you know, did know God at a young age and stayed faithful. I think that's super powerful because especially like in our day now, like you could choose to do anything yeah, and you choose to stay faithful in this, even through all the hard times and through all the whatever pushback and the everything else you've chose to stay faithful. And there's power in that story too. But a lot of times I think people don't share because they feel like, well, I don't really have a testimony. I, and it's yeah, like, and those yeah, people, you do. Those people like, say that all the time. I don't have a testimony. Yeah, uh-huh. No, and listen, let me t- tell you from someone who came through the other side of that, mm-hmm. I would choose your path 10 times out of 10 times than the path that I took. Mm-hmm. My All sure, when I share my testimony on stage and then how God has saved me, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. But listen, inside of that testimony, there is still an unbelievable amount of brokenness mm-hmm. because of the path that I chose yeah. in life that you don't have to deal right. with because oh, yeah. you made the right decision. You were wiser than all of us to make that decision yeah. when you were young and to stay faithful to that mm-hmm. because, like, all these testimonies are awesome. But, listen, beneath that testimony is a wor- – that's why, like, I don't uh, – because I've walked through it, I don't have, like, a hopelessness about mm-hmm. people. But also I realize, yes, God can save you, but if you want to take that hard road – the brokenness that comes with it yeah. is going to really make what where you want to go in life ultimately very difficult, yeah. right? And so there's there is a beauty in people that figured it out yeah. early, yeah, and they don't have to deal with some of the same stuff because um, they didn't open themselves mm-hmm. up to being broken in those different ways, yeah. um, and that is more advantageous, yeah. I think. Um, then, oh, I've got a cool story, mm-hmm. but I also got a bunch of baggage yeah. that I'm still carrying through life in some yeah. different ways well, that I'm still failing as the result yeah. of the path that I chose to walk in, in the in the past. And so, but no matter what path that was that you took, mm-hmm. you cannot hide who you used to be mm-hmm. if you want to be effective in reaching people right. for Jesus. Because 
They they need mm-hmm. to know that it's real. They need to know that it's not just like fairy tales and fables. It's not just well wishes or whatever. Like mm-hmm. they need to know that it is actually made a difference in your life. Yeah. You may not have it all together. You may still make mistakes. You may, may still do stupid stuff. Mm-hmm. But they need to know that it it. And this is what people don't share. Like 40% of people in America mm-hmm. said that no one had ever shared the gospel with them, right. ever. Yeah. Like, no one had, like, what was it? I think it was another 60% of people that had had um, said no one had shared the benefit mm-hmm. of being a Christian. Yeah. Like, that's, that's so sad because there is, there is benefits to share. Like I'm not like did did being a Christian make me wealthy? No, did it like fix everything in my life? No, but are there benefits to living this way? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Like that's I mean research shows over and over and over and over again that the stuff that the Bible stands for leads mm-hmm. to human flourishing, leads yeah. to good communities, good societies, good good countries fairness and equality mm-hmm. and all of these different things we see this over and over and over and over again and so you should share the benefits of yeah, it absolutely absolutely and i think like we see some of that even with the israelites in the story that you shared from of how like you know they allowed their i mean they were a people who were chosen by god early on like you know they were the people who followed god early on and and yet like here god's freeing them but yet they still have some things to work through and you know they've not entered into the place that they were, should have long before they did because they allowed themselves to take the hard road yep. right and and then you see them like even after some some things like not good or good, decide, okay, yeah, we're going to fight for this. We're going to do this. Yeah. And you kind of challenge us to to fight in that way. And I think that sometimes, like, there are, like you said, what, what was the statistic about, like, that a lot of churches don't, pastors don't challenge their 75% people? 75% of church congregations do not talk yeah. about sharing your faith. Yeah. It. Think about this. Like, what you were just saying, though. The, it's a fight. Yeah. And this is the picture that just pulled up in my head, probably because I was listening to um, Angela Johnson. She's a comedian. She was telling this funny joke about the movie Taken because she was taking a trip to to Europe. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I just had this this thought, like, listen, think about the people in your life that you love. Mm-hmm. If you did go to Europe and mm-hmm. someone came and tried to snatch them and take them away mm-hmm. from you, what would you do? You would fight like you've never fought before in your life, yeah. right? That's exactly what you would do. Mm-hmm. You would turn straight up into a spiritual Liam Neeson, mm-hmm. right? You would go wild if someone was trying to snatch mm-hmm. your kid from you, yeah. if someone was trying to ta- snatch your friend mm-hmm. from you. You would fight in ways that you did not even know that you had it in you to fight. Mm-hmm. Why then is it that we would do that to someone on the streets that tried to to steal our family from us, steal our friends. And I'm telling you, spiritual enemy is stealing our friends and family, and yet we do not fight like that. You need to become a spiritual Liam Neeson. You need to let the the devil know that you've got a very special set of skills and abilities that, like, I am going to start to fight for the people. Like, you're not just going to carry my people off Mm -hmm. anymore. It is a fight. It's – but – Please, Christians, understand who the fight is against. It is against principalities Mm -hmm. and powers uh, of darkness, not Uh the people themselves. Too often, like, we demonize the people. We're trying to fight with the people. Yeah. But you don't see the the nefarious spiritual Mm -hmm. being behind all of that. That's who the battle's actually with. Yeah. And so that's why so many Christians in their evangelism strategies turn so many people off because they forget the battle's not against flesh and blood. The battle is against principalities of darkness. Mm -hmm. And the the battle was being waged in the unseen world. This is why, like, I've been doing this book club now for two years. Two of the books that we've done have been on spiritual warfare Mm -hmm. because people don't understand. Yeah. Yes, I have a very rational approach to faith. Yes, I like to talk about apologetics, and and I'll give you all the rational, scientific, I'll give you all of that. But listen, Mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I'm still 
a person that understands there is an unseen world mm -hmm. that is waging war, yeah. that is a fight for every single person um, that has ever existed. And if you don't see it like that, of course, you would never let somebody just walk off with your child. You went down mm -hmm. to Charleston Town Center Mall, someone just grabbed your kid, and you'd just be like, oh, well, yeah. you know, I, too bad. I guess, see you. <laughs> no, you would cause a scene. Yeah. You would throw a fit. Yeah. You would fight. You would do anything possible to get that child back. So why is it then do you keep letting the spiritual enemy kidnap the people that you love and carrying them far off? Mm-hmm. You can't, you got to, it is a fight, but it is not a fight with those people. That's why we don't come up in there and be like, oh, can't believe you're living with your boyfriend. Can't believe you're living with your girlfriend. You're always out there having sex, just living in sin. Like, okay, all that stuff needs fixed, okay? Mm -hmm. there, that's a given, but can we start with the gospel? Yeah. Can we start with the fact that Jesus has paid a price for them to know him, and he'll clean up all that other stuff? Like, yeah. can we start there? Don't mm -hmm. fight with the people. Fight for the people. Yeah. That that's that. Like I, I wish I'd, I wish I'd brought Liam Neeson into uh, Sunday. Wow. That'd have been you fun. didn't know. Yeah. We'll just have to. It's only share this, this is a, podcast. It's only a so. special. This is a special illustration for the extra point crowd. Yeah. So no. I need you to get the word out that we're talking about Liam Neeson on here. <laughs> I love it. Um, so one of the things that we shared in our discussion with the teens was from Colossians four. Um, verse two through six and i find this because i think that a lot of times <laughs> we're probably doing a little bit of opposite of what this scripture says like we're sitting around we're hoping that nobody asks us mm -hmm. about our faith because we're not necessarily ready to answer that or we're nervous that we're going to mess it up or whatever and so i loved how you talked about like your job is to just be obedient. You're not yeah. responsible for the person's reaction. But the, yeah. the scripture says, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Pray for us, too, that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. That is why I'm here in chains. Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. Live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversations be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. This text right here, I think, is so important for us to yeah. really kind of pray this about our, ourselves and each other as well. Like to, hey, like, let's be wise and let's make the most of every opportunity. Be gracious in your talk. Like, so when you're faced with those opportunities where maybe their life is a little messy, they're not living in the perfect whatever, how can you be gracious in such a way where you can share with them and talk with them to where you can share that message that can help them get to that place where then Jesus can come yeah. and clean up? Well, yeah, and this is, this is that other part of evangelism. I didn't get into it yesterday, but they've, always, they've called it, as long as I've been alive, mm -hmm. lifestyle evangelism. Right, and some people that's the only evangelism they do. I'm highly against that. Lifestyle evangelism is legit, though. Mm -hmm. Like, people are watching, people are listening. Right. So if you're if you're having conversations with non-believers mm -hmm. that are always negative, always this is one of my this is one of my own personal issues. I got to work through this. That are always negative, always complaining, just aren't mm -hmm. seasoned with with grace. Mm -hmm. You're you're if you're having conversations with non-believers where you're backstabbing, mm -hmm. gossiping, complaining. Believe it or not, that affects their view of you and Christianity right. in general. Yeah. If you like, and look, I've I have to live through this because I have a stupid mouth that says stuff all the time that I shouldn't, and in situations, then I go, well, dag on it, I right there, that is going to be a problem, mm -hmm. if because if there's an inconsistency there that they can see when you go, hey, would you love to come to church with me? They're like. I mean, <laughs> what is it that's different about your life than my mm -hmm. life? If if you're complaining and gossiping, and right. you're compl you know you're talking bad about your husband or your wife, and and you're you you're out doing all the same stuff that we're doing. Why do I need to come to church with you? I don't need to come to church with you. Mm -hmm. If our lives aren't any different, if your kids' lives aren't any different than my kids' lives, what do we need like all that for? Now look, and I have messed that up as much as anybody. And it sucks. It sucks so bad because I you do love these people. You want to reach them, but then you realize that your own actions are probably one of the things that is standing in the way of them accepting your invitation, right? Like for me, uh, if I've acted like a fool before, 
Like, I'll walk away from that. It'll take me about five minutes, and the Lord will be like, well, I guess you better hope that that person doesn't show up at church on Sunday <laughs> and see you up on that stage. They act like an idiot right there, right? How, how many times has that happened? But, no, granted, are we going to be perfect? No, we're going to have those moments. That's the hard thing about it. People have to see the overall trajectory of your life is different than theirs, even though you might have acted like a fool mm -hmm. in the moment. You might have said something you shouldn't have. You might have, you know, reacted poorly to a situation mm -hmm. uh, or whatever it might be. You might have acted like a fool in the moment, but they got to see something different. Like for me, one of the things that I've noticed is that non-believers, they don't apologize. Mm -hmm. When they do something wrong, they do not apologize. For me, I still mess it up, but I will go and apologize, and it catches people off guard. They'll be like, what? No, yeah. No, nah, man. Like, you're, it's cool. Like, it's cool. Because they've never had anyone apologize to them. No, man, listen. Uh, like, I had, to tell, I had to tell a guy last basketball season. Um, I said, listen, I'm, I, I'm a pastor. I'm a man of God, and I did, some, I did you wrong. I shouldn't, mm -hmm. have, I shouldn't have said that to you. I said, I can't, I can't just, like, do that and then act like I didn't do it. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'm a little envious of people that can do that. <laughs> But I can't. Yeah. Like, if I if I mess up, like, my conscience immediately hits yeah. me. The Holy Spirit of me is like, dude, you got to make that right. And mm -hmm. so when I get back and apologize to people, they'll be like, mm -hmm. this is wild. Yeah. Like, again, I, I, I wish that I didn't have to apologize because I wish that I didn't screw it up in the first place. But, again, what is the overall trajectory? Like, they have – you have they have to see mm -hmm. it. But I've met people that will be like, oh, yeah, yeah, my evangelism strategy is just to live my life. Right. Yeah. I mean – you should live a, a, a good, holy life that is different than other people. But if that's your only evangelism mm -hmm. strategy, you, you've got to put words to it eventually. Yeah. Like, you have to have that conversation mm -hmm. eventually. It can't just be, well, they see it. They see it. They see it. They'll come and ask about it. Yeah. That was always the thing that people would always, uh, if, if you're living right and your life is all this, people, they'll just, they'll just flock up to you. And, uh, like, there'll be everybody wanting to ask, what's different about you? You know what? Yeah. As long as I've been following Jesus, that's never happened to me. Not right. once. What people just walking up random to you? Hey, you look different. You got a different glow about you. What's different about you? No, it didn't. It came in like my best evangelism has happened in the context of relationships, mm -hmm. where people have gotten to see more than just one moment of me, right? Like I remember, um, like again, a lot of my stuff surrounds my stupid mouth and my competitive nature. So I've messed up so much being a a sporty sports coach and a sports dad that like but I was talking to my mentor one time like a year or two ago and I was telling him like man I, I will be praying about this all week and show up at a tournament and still do something stupid mm -hmm. I will it's a, like just inevitably we'll, we'll do it and then um I, I told him I said I feel like I'm just like destroying my witness and the whole reason I'm in all of this is because I want to reach people for Jesus and sports is a good outlet and I said, um, but I said, but the crazy thing is, like, these people, they still, they will watch us online. They come to our church and all this stuff. He goes, so they've seen you do that and still come to your church. I was like, yeah. He's like, well, then that means that they've seen, like, they're not just judging you based on that one moment. Yeah. You've done life with them to the point where they realize, all right, yeah, yeah he does something stupid in that moment. But I've seen enough about him to go, but that's not who he is. Right. So he's like, you're, you're like being really hard on yourself. Right. If these people will show up at your church, yeah. then, I mean, you shouldn't have done it. Let's just be honest. But, they're, like, if you're doing it, like, if you're doing life with people, they can see more than that moment. Mm -hmm. And and so lifestyle evangelism ultimately has to result in relationships where people can, can talk to you, mm -hmm. right? Like, where people can go like, oh, okay, you're – you're human. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. You're human. You make mistakes, but like you're really trying yeah. to do better. Absolutely. So lifestyle evangelism, yes, but eventually it's got to result in conversations with people. I don't think unless you're a very, very, very gifted evangelist like Ray Comfort, you know, uh, what's that dude from, from Growing Pains? Kirk Cameron. Oh, yeah. One of those type of guys. If you're not one of them. I don't know, if you're not gifted like them, I don't think talking to strangers mm -hmm. is a great yeah. strategy. Yeah. Um, I think it happens as we do life with people. Mm -hmm. um, they find that, because strangers can judge you on a moment. Right, that's all they have. Yeah, that's all so, they have. They, yeah. they, they have that moment of you. Um, but, mm -hmm. but 
when you do it in the confines of a relationship, people can see your overall trajectory and go like, oh, okay, yeah, no, he mm -hmm. he shouldn't have done that. But, like, I've also been around him enough to know how he treats his wife, how he mm -hmm. treats his kids, how he treats yeah. – other people, the fact yeah. that he's probably going to go and apologize mm -hmm. for that once he realizes what an idiot he just looked like. Like, yeah. when once they see all that, then the conversation is different mm -hmm. than, like, just walking up to people on the street and, like, accosting them with yeah. how awful they are. Well, that's what, like, I know that's what probably intimidates a lot of people of doing, like, certain short-term mission trips and things like that. But I, I loved when we went to New York mm -hmm. and we had training and we had role-playing, like, where we – we're given these little strips of paper with these uh, potential people that we might meet yeah. and, ha and get to share with. Like, unless you can go through some training like that or unless, like, whatever, like, yeah, I agree. But I think it's always going to be best in the context of that relationship because yeah. they are going to know you better and they'll know that you care about them a little bit different, like, to where yeah. then when you maybe do broach a subject that is hard or difficult – or might make them feel some guilt or whatever, then they know that, like, ultimately you care about them yeah. as a person, as an individual. And so they're not going to feel um, what they might feel if, like, a random stranger comes up to them. Yeah, I'm already doing life with enough non-believers to reach. Mm -hmm. I don't need to go be weird on the streets <laughs> with strangers. Yeah. Right? Like, I have a ton of people in my life that are not saved. Yeah. That's my mission field. Mm -hmm. I don't need to go creep people right. out at Walmart. Yeah. Hey, I see you're buying a loaf of bread. Have you heard about the bread of life? Like, I like just, <laughs> like, no, you, I don't need to do that. I have plenty of opportunity with the lost mm -hmm. right where I'm at. Yeah. And so. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, I'll finish with this, th this statement that you shared on Sunday to just remind us and encourage us. Evangelism is contagious, and so is the lack of evangelism. And so if you want to see more people, um, enter the kingdom of God, then start. it starts with you. Yeah. It starts with us um, doing our part, and then we can see others catch on to that as well. So that way it does become contagious. That way, 50 years from now, um, we see a spike in Christianity rather than a decline. Yeah. Um, that's our hope for the future. And um, again, we'll be back here again next week with another episode of The Extra Point to give you more practical next steps for your faith journey. Thanks for tuning in to The Extra Point. Be sure to subscribe to the Southridge Church Podcast and tune in every Wednesday for another episode of The Extra Point.